Dr. Chris Burrett. Welcome to the ACOs, A Different Kind of Psychiatry case presentation webinar. We're glad to have you. Today's presentation is brought to you by Dr. Alberto Folia. His presentation is entitled, Treating the Effects of Permissive Parenting. Dr. Alberto Folia is board certified in psychiatry by the Swiss Board of Psychiatry and in medical ergonomy by the American College of Ergonomy. Dr. Folia has a medical organ therapy practice in Lugano, Switzerland, where he treats infants, children, and adults. Dr. Folia, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Burrit. Thank you to everybody. I'm glad to be here and I hope to satisfy your interest and curiosity. Dr. Folia, maybe you can just start by saying of all the cases you're treating right now, how did you decide to treat the, how did you decide to present this case? I want to present this case because it is a very interesting case. It is a three-year-old child with severe behavioral disturbances due to exaggerated permissiveness. I want What's to the to child's show... name? Little Mario. Mario, little Mario. And I want to show how medical organ therapy is effective as a therapy of emotion, sensation, and instincts rather than uh, words with such a little child. So maybe just start off by saying, what, what had his mother bring him to treatment with you? What, what was the problem? Uh, first, the mother was already a patient of mine, so it was easy for her to ask for my help. Her son was aggressive, uh, was unbearable, he was hyperactive, he moved around, and the mother received many calls from the teachers at kindergarten because he was uh, harassing the other children and even, even beating them. So it hmm. was a severe, severe uh, disturbance of his behavior. Did this occur suddenly or had this been going on? At home too? Uh, de developing slowly, progressing slowly until the teachers really had enough and uh, really asked the mother to do something. And that's when she decided to bring him. I see. And when I saw him, I was myself uh, shocked. Uh, his behavior was uh, really very bad. Uh, he was aggressive, he didn't want to uh, um, separate from his mother, he didn't want to go to the couch where I wanted to examine him, and it reminded me to a research uh, made in the 70s, 80s by Jane Goodalls on chimpanzee. There was a little story of the mother Flo, uh, uh, old chimpanzee, that was unable to win her little child Flint. Winning for chimpanzee means taking them off their shoulders. Flint didn't want. The mother tried to bring him down, but she was weak because of old age. And he made a huge temper. And I want to show you this video and you will hear the voice of Jane Goodall herself. When denied his way, Flint threw violent temper tantrums, even hitting and biting his mother. Perhaps because she was too old to cope, Flo often gave in and let Flint have his way. Later, this would have grave consequences. She looked afraid of him. She's weak. She's, uh, you see two equivalents between the chimpanzee and my humans. The child behaves in the same way uh, little Mario did on the couch, the same temper as uh, Flint. Even worse, in one occasion, he, um, uh, he, he, he made like he had a gun and pointed to the face of her mother, something I've never seen in a child like that, so small like that. And the equivalent of the mother, my patient mother, was also weak, not because of the age, but because of her neurosis. And she was also scared of her son. She was unable to limit him. C can you describe how uh, therapy began then with uh, little Mario? Yeah. Uh, 
uh, I use uh, organ therapy, use a couch as a tool, like the stethoscope, I use uh, the couch. With little children, this tool is very important. Uh, very little children, you put them, you ask the mother to put them on the couch and they show you a central feeling, which is very touching and very moving. And it is trust. They trust you and they are curious at you. They touch you, they look at you. I tell you, it's very moving. Disturbed children, don't do that. Disturbed children don't want to go to the couch, uh, fight against it, uh, yell against it. And little Mario made his temper as soon as his mother wanted to put him on the couch. Mm -hmm. what, what does Mario look like if you could describe him a little bit? He's a little tough, uh, uh, kind tough of guy? boy, kind of boy. But once uh, he, uh, he came into my office, he began to yell and cry. You could see he was half uh, terrified and half aggressive. Uh, this is, this is a so-called attachment problem. This, uh, uh, distancing from his mother with a, a friend, uh, with a, an unknown adult is for him a, a, an enormous uh, um, moment of anxiety. And uh, he fight against that. I see, which makes sense why then the problems would start coming out in school even more than at home. Exactly. Exactly. So in the room and in the couch, you see, uh, like in the adults, a concentration of his neurosis. You could see everything, him and his mother neurosis. I see. And uh, doing that, uh, looking at uh, him discharging all this rage and fear and the mother learning slowly to bring him on the couch, just to, to do what she said was therapeutic for him. Uh, in four sessions, he was, I could say, cured by his uh, hyperactivity. Maybe you could say something. While the mother was putting Mario on the couch, what, what did you do? How did you uh, help them with that process? That's interesting because uh, in this process, in this process, which I, ca I call a battle, um, little Mario didn't look at me at all. I was inexistent and I didn't fall in the trap of being the bad guys that take him and put him on the couch and the mother doesn't learn to be uh, assertive be with him. So I just told her mother every five, uh, five minutes, uh, I'm expecting you to bring him on the couch if you want him, uh, if you want me to examine him and to treat him. So it was a- Dr. Foy, that's oh. interesting that, that you say that. It, it wasn't that this is what has to be done, but it, th this is how I do things. And if this is something that's important to you, you know, th this is what we do. Exactly. And the mother learned with me to do some things she will do at home. She has to be assertive with him, even if I'm not absent. The father had the same problem. He wanted to help his wife and intervened, and he was a bad guy. And that was not good. It brought to nothing. So, so dad was coming to the rescue. Exactly. To the rescue that was not uh, productive for the education of little Mario. It was the opposite because he called his mother. The mother was not able to be assertive. So uh, only the father was assertive and this was not good. Mm. The mother had to learn to change her behavior with her son. So if I'm hearing you correctly, so for these first four sessions, you were sitting there almost not existing in the process, except when mother looks over to you saying, what do I do? Exactly. And you say, I'm and expecting you to. And sometimes telling to little Mario, little Mario, I want you to lie down. And yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't look at me. I was a nothing. Uh -huh. so, so you were observing and, and um, a fly on the wall as mother and child work things out between the two of them. Exactly, exactly. Uh -huh. And every session, Little Mario went home and he made an improvement. He was better and better after every session. At the fourth session, he began with his temper like usual. And at the end, he accepted 
to look at me and to do what I wanted him to do. And at that moment, he became my patient. That, that's he, wonderful to hear. So it was, you were working with mother for those first four appointments and sessions. And then Mario said, okay, here I am. Exactly. And uh, at the fifth session, Mario stayed in the therapy room with me alone without his mother. Wow. And from then on, he began therapy like other children with lesser severe, less severe disturbances. And did the mother hear from school about how things were uh, during that period of time? Oh, yes. She had a feedback from school that uh, Mario was much better than before. Yes. Mm. Wow. And, and so you're saying he was very hyperactive and that hyperactivity was basically given up after those four sessions. Exactly. Exactly. And this is very interesting about the discussion uh, about the famous now, now very famous uh, syndrome, uh, ADHD, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. This is a modern psychiatry diagnosis. We don't agree about that for us. ADHD is a symptom, it is not a diagnosis. Uh, you can have, like little Mario, a severe ADHD, but the real character diagnosis is not that severe. Uh, impulsivity is not his primary symptom. So that's why he was cured in only four sessions. There are other children where impulsivity is the primary impulse. A sick impulse, and then you will need much more than four sessions to, to do something. The you hyperactivity need... didn't run as deep. Exactly. This was a behavioral educational problem. Other children is a deeper problem. Thank this you. was exactly life, like Flo and Flint. It was an attachment problem. Yeah. yeah. And so was the mother still in therapy as her son was also coming to therapy? Yes, and that was uh, decisive. Without that, I don't think uh, we could have that uh, success. Could you describe that process a little bit, how your therapy with her uh, changed or was modified as you were beginning to work with her son? I don't think that, I'm, unfortunately, I cannot show you the video. I don't have the permission to show you the video. But I don't think that a mother with, who is not in therapy could stand to see her son making that temper uh, uh, in, in a medical office. She would think that he is upset by me, that he is upset by the therapy. And that, that this is not the problem of the son. So I don't think it would be possible for a mother without therapy to understand what is going on. I want to make sure I understand that correctly. You're saying that um, if he were to have that tantrum and she didn't have her own experience with therapy, she would see that as, as just coming from that process of being with you in the therapy office, not being something central to their relationship? Yes. Most probably, yes, unfortunately. And that's why I don't treat children if uh, the mother is not already in therapy with me. I see. Yeah. The child is a, an extension of his mother. And if I treat the child, it's like treating the mother uh, and vice versa too. So it, it's not good. I had many bad experiences with mother that uh, who were not in therapy. I see, yeah. Yeah, yeah you know, with my own patients, I, I've, I've seen a difference, uh, like you're describing, is if, if I'm treating their one of their parents or, or both or, and working with the kid, it, it lends itself to being a, a simpler process. Um, yeah. Because there's so much education and, and having a feel for the depth and the intensity of the emotions that, that come up in working with a child. Yes. If they are not used to their intensity and uh, uh, hidden emotions, they cannot uh, grasp uh, what's going on with their ch children on the couch. Mm. Yeah. And then how did therapy progress after he became a patient of yours? 
then <laughs> it progressed like with many children, very boring, very boring, completely different. Children who has some symptoms, but no longer social symptoms like he had, can be very bored in therapy. So usually if they don't have much problem, problem, therapy is only 20 minutes, making contact with me, looking how they react, and that's it. And that's it. Making contact is very important with children. You say that's it, but it actually sounds quite important. Yes, it is important. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very satisfying treating children. Very. You uh -huh. can have great change in few sessions. Yeah. Well, like I mean, in, like in little Mario case. Yeah. Yeah. So what were his difficulties after that initial attachment problem was uh, addressed what was addressed in his therapy yes his contactlessness that was boring because he's, he was contactless uh, that is he, he didn't feel and he, he was not in contact with his deeper feelings I see. so he was already pretty armored for a little child like that uh -huh. so he was bored and yeah. you need many, many sessions because you cannot be too intensive to, you cannot intervene too, too strongly with the child. You have to be- You're saying you don't push them. You don't push them don't to push. have contact, to make contact. Yes. I see. So his subjective experience of his lack of contact was a feeling of boredom. Is that accurate? Exactly. Exactly. I see. And this is much easier to- uh, an uh, approach with older children, this boredom. When they are 11, 12, so they lie down, they got bored, but they learn slowly to feel this boredom as the superficial layer of many symptoms that are completely hidden. And this is uh, usually a wonderful experience to mm. see slowly, session by session, these feelings comes up. I always say boredom is like the crust of the volcano. If you sit on it, you accept the boredom, sooner or later you will feel the heat coming up. I love that's that. Boredom. Yeah, that's boredom. Yeah. So the challenge that makes me think of is just helping teenagers or young children to even get to the point where they're feeling bored because there's so much so many distractions these days, they can't even get to that that crust that you're describing. Yes. Unfortunately, yes. Hmm. We live in a very over-expanded, uh, uh, over-excited society. And this is a, a big problem. Yeah. I see. Like and we live in a permissive society. Little Mario was the product of exaggerated permissiveness which is part of this overexcitation, every, everything is good, you may do whatever you want, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a question from the audience. Yep. What is the role of, of the father in therapy? Should he be in treatment too? How, how do you address that? That's a good question. Uh, I think the mother, because of her biological uh, function, is more important. The father is like you see in animals, he protect the couple. He's around them and he protect uh, the couple so that they can develop harmoniously. So if uh, only the father in therapy is not that good as only the mother. If he wants to do therapy, then it's wonderful. Then you have two parents that know what's going on. In, in Mario's case? In Mario's case, <laughs> Uh, the poor father was like me. He was nothing. Uh, he was not even looked at. Uh, and if he wanted to do something, it was worse. Uh, because uh, mother and son were so involved in, the, in, her, in their symbiosis that every, everybody else was not important. So the, the father could do only wrong. And I had, I had to teach him also to not fall in the trap. You had him come to the office? Yes, yes. I see. Not fall in the trap. Don't try to help your wife. Would be worse. 
So it wasn't that he had his own therapy, but but education as is looking at the effect that, that he was having on the relationship. Yes. Mm-hmm. So it was off and off a medical organ therapy for uh, little Mario and social organ intervention, social organ therapy for mother and also the father. I see. And um, you, you're touching on the biological role of fathers. And I know that, um, you know, has to be identified. It's not something you label, but uh, it, it makes sense what you're saying that, um, like the father protects the mother-child relationship from external forces that may um, yes. interfere. So he has more uh, social function compared to the mother. Yeah. Who has a more uh, psychic, biological function. Hmm. And another question from the audience member is, could you say something about... Um, the mother's difficulty, how did that contribute to her role in in Mario? This is a sad part of the story. Her permissiveness come from severe abuses she uh, had as a child. She grew up sexually abused by a family member. So she grew up confused, weak, submitted, chaotic. She came to me in a really bad shape. She was much better when she uh, got pregnant uh, after several years of therapy, but unfortunately not enough uh, to uh, be able to see when her child became also abusive. Mm. She submitted again, Mm. this time to him. So this is... That was a deep attitude in her to submit to any kind of aggression against her. Unfortunately, yes. This was a problem. That's why she was so exaggeratedly permissive. That was her weakness compared to the weakness of flow, which was more more natural. Old age. I see. So so you're touching on the psychological versus biological. You know, we're we're looking at animals interacting and, and there's a uh, um, the same the same phenomena is ex- you're experiencing with with human interaction. How do you see that? I see that thanks to medical organ therapy that today we give too much importance to to the cognitive, to the consciousness, to the psychological. But uh, neurosis already shown by Freud and more so by Reich. Uh, are rooted in the biology of human being, in the instinct, in the emotions, in the sensation, in the autonomous nervous system, rather than in the brain. Mm. And uh, you can see that in chimpanzee, which are not that developed centrally and show exactly the same disturbances in, in this case as human. I see. Yeah. Another question that came in was, do you see any other uh, factors uh, contributing to, to Mario's armoring and difficulty aside from his mother? Was there any other factors that were involved? Ma, uh, I think that a factor in uh, little Mario is also his nature. This is his uh, healthy side. He is for sure, like his father, strong. He is energetically a strong child. I think that if he would have been less strong, his mother would have had less problem with him. This estranged, which is natural, was surely, surely uh, one of the factor that made this this neurosis between him and his mother. Hmm. So you're talking about the the mismatch of of the nature of Mario and how that uh, inter that related with his mother and, and her nature and, and her character combination. And I, I like that you highlight that because sometimes that can just be a spontaneous process that two natures, you know, clash. Yeah, but there is also a nature and a, a, a neurosis. Yeah. Uh, I see many high energetic children 
I want to say something before. I see the child rearing like uh, a brook that comes from the mountains and uh, develop, grows up and grows up and become a, a strong river and goes to the ocean. Uh, for us, it's the same, becoming from a small little thing to a strong independent individual, going into happiness in love, work and knowledge. This is the ocean. But you, you have a nature, a different nature. You have uh, strong brooks and uh, small brooks, uh, weak brooks and uh, high energetic brooks. And high energetic brooks uh, are more in danger than weak brooks. As light neurosis of the parents, as light intervention from the society can change uh, a lot. Uh, Trauma in early, very early childhood and high energy can be a very dangerous uh, uh, um, connection. Very dangerous. Dr. Foley, that, that makes me think of, uh, aside from my private practice, I've worked in corrections and jails and prisons. And there you can get a sense of just this wonderful high energy, this nature, and it could be aggressive, it could be reaching out, trying to make connections. And when that gets thwarted, it, it becomes horrible, you know? Yes. Yeah. And you you go in a, you say a nursery in America where all the children are, the little uh -huh. born children are, you can see the difference between the different children. There are the low that sleep all the time, and there are the big, big, very strong little children. If something happened to them, then you have big problems. And yeah. it's very, very easy to disturb that trustfulness that you see in little children. This is a real danger. This trustfulness makes them very, um, uh, how do you say, uh, very easy to be disturbed. Maybe you could say more about that. You're saying when you see a young child who's uh, lively and healthy, there's just this natural um, spontaneous connection you have with them and there's this trust. Um, how does that become disturbed so early? Any, any disturbance of contact disturbs the capacity of contact of the little child. So a mother who is contactless, completely contactless, say with her uh, invasivity, you say in English, uh, tendency to invade others. To, to so, um, insert themselves into other people's lives. Intervene and be aggressive and pushy without knowing. I she, see. Just, she takes her child like that. I love you. And uh, for the little child, this is not love. This is an aggression. This is enough to ruin mm. the capacity of contact of the little child. But even uh, a smoother, uh, light, uh, lighter intervention can disturb the contact. It is a very, very fine uh, equilibrium. So it's very easy to uh, neurotize a child. Very easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Um, there's a question from one of the audience members going back to the father. Um, did, did he get that easily, that your suggestion to, to you can only cause harm to just stay out of it? Was that, did that just come naturally? He said, okay, or, or was there a trouble? He, and he was happy because <laughs> finally he understood all his problems with, uh, with his wife and his son. I try to help my wife, and every time is worse uh, than, than if I did nothing. Uh, but I tried every day, and it was a mess. So when I explained it to him that it was for no, uh, no help, uh, because the problem was a mother, so he was happy, he was released. And it so it sounded like you confirmed with him something he already felt, but didn't know what to do with it. Yeah, Exactly. exactly. Hmm. So he pulled back and he was happy. Maybe we're talking about permissiveness a lot. And this just came in my mind. How do you help a parent know if they're being permissive? How do they, how do you help them see a behavior as permissive or not? I, I think there's a lot more confusion in parenting than ever before. It used to be much more clear. This is how things were. Um, it was clear because it was authoritarian. 
Now it is no longer clear because it is permissive, but in, in reality, it is a, a dichotomy, when to be authoritarian and when to be uh, permissive. We went uh, from a poison of the past, authoritarianism, to today's poison, permissiveness. You cannot understand this problem without the fundamental distinction uh, Reich did between primary and secondary impulses. If you see this difference, primary impulses are healthy from the core, they are clean, they are open, you feel them as something uh, wonderful in little children and also in animals, and uh, secondary hypocrite, uh, uh, uneasy, disturbing, fake. Uh, 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 a good example of a secondary emotion is whining instead of crying. Whining is, is not crying, is not, uh, is not uh, clear, is not direct, it's indirect. So when you make this distinction and you make this distinction with the guts, you don't make it with the, with the mind. Uh, then it's, it's easy. In the past, people were authoritarian against every impulse. Everything was smashed down. Today, we are permissive, permissive with everything. And this is not right. You got to be permissive with primary healthy emotions. You got to be authoritarian with secondary destructive emotions. The mother of little Mario learned to be authoritarian with the destructive impulses of her son. But that doesn't mean that she will be authoritarian against his primary emotions, which are still there. Mm. Yes. Yeah, there's another question about how do you distinguish and, and how do you um, figure out what's permissive? But what I'm hearing from the audience is uh, there, there's great difficulty in having a uh, sense for that. It's not easy. It's not easy. I cannot give you a recept to that. But just knowing that, that there is this fundamental distinction, you will learn in years. You cannot learn today how to distinguish between a primary and a secondary emotion. You need a practice on that. Uh, looking, observing uh, children, youngsters, even adults, we, uh, as ergonomists, we are used to, this, to see that in our patients, and we are used to perceive the difference. Uh, Reich described in character analysis everything which is uh, uh, secondary is disturbing. But this is disturbing when you are used to that and you are pretty in contact with your emotion. You can be contactless against that. You cannot distinguish between a real crying and a secondary crying. It's, it's not that easy. The question is very, very, very difficult to answer. Yeah, and um, the parent can be out of it or out of contact and, and just know that there's something, some emotion being displayed and, and they're having difficulty in, in figuring that out. But I like what you said, which is that it takes time and you can't just you know, read a book about it. And this, this is what you stop. This is what you um, allow to come out, come forward. And what I'd add having a two and a half and a three and a half year old is it also changes. Um, as soon as you think, you know, what to yes. do to help ra raise a child, it, it changes, you know, a week later, a month later. Yes. And um, I, I think that's important to keep in mind too, is that, that it's life. It's, it's always moving. So I, uh, in my metaphor of the brook that becomes a river, I say uh, it is exactly early when it is still a, a brook that it tends to divert every five minutes. You solve the problem and the day after you have another completely new. I had a girl who came uh, to therapy because she began to be obsessive and clean her hands in an exaggerated way. In one session, she got out her rage and this disappear completely. Mm. Three days after that, she began to have another problem. She began to whine, and then you have to begin with the whining. So they tend always to, to, to divert the, the path to the ocean, unfortunately, unfortunately.
Yes, and you, it, so you, you have to be aware and, and observing of, of what's going on. And, and uh, especially, you know, it's not just children who are more distracted than ever, it's, it's parents too. And so the more distracted they are, the less they can be aware of, of what's happening and have the time to observe. But this tells you how, how uh, the role of uh, parents, school, society is important in uh, uh, helping little brooks to go to the oceans. It's not easy. They don't go alone. In, uh, in the 60s, 70s, in the revolutionary years, we all thought that just letting a child grow up like an animal, it would be fine. It is not like that. It's very difficult for them to follow the path to the ocean. So the role of parents is decisive. But that was the be beginning you're saying of that permissiveness of saying, we're too repressive, we're too restrictive. We just have to let, like stand back and let things develop as if that was all that it took for raising a child. And we went from a disease to other, another disease. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like the way you describe it. That, that's beautiful. Yeah. So, um, Dr. Foley, maybe you could just underscore what was it that allowed you to help Mario so well and, and so rapidly? Uh, first, medical organ therapy. It is a therapy about emotions, sensation, and instincts. You cannot approach a three-year child with words. Uh, if you use words, you can educate her mother, that's it. But it was not enough to educate her mother. Uh, little Mario needed to discharge his temper in treatment room and not at home. This was therapeutic for him, as it was therapeutic for the mother to learn to be authoritarian against his secondary emotion. But medical organ therapy and this instinctual uh, approach was decisive. Mm. Well said. And I'm curious, do you know how Mario is doing now? How old is he? Uh, he is no longer my patient. He is now, I think, 12. I know from uh, uh, people who know him that he is doing well, that he never, he, he never was uh, uh, hyperactive again. He was well until now. So that's great to hear. Yes. yes. <laughs> and that's it's important. interesting with children. Eh? Uh, it happens often that I don't see them in the boredom uh, uh, phase. So they don't want to come anymore. Many of them don't come. And then they are, say, 14, 15 year old, and they have a problem. And they ask a parent, why do you bring me? You don't bring me to Dr. Folia that I want to discuss with him that and that problems. That happens, and it's very, very interesting. Huh. So basically, if I'm hearing you correctly, you leave the door open. If something okay. comes up, yes, they can return. They can. They can. I, I like that too because you're not telling them what they need or what they should do, but but allowing them to come to you if if they need it. Yes, I think even that is allowing them to figure things out and giving them the independence to. Um, deal with their own problems, you know? Yes, and they remember what they did. Uh, for example, they, they can get rage out in therapy and they come to an age where emotion comes up very, very strong. They need to cry, they need to rage out. And so they remember what they did with me as a little children and now they want to do it again. Dr. Folia, I, I need to discharge my rage. Yeah. A question came in from the audience you know, about just would traditional psychiatrists prescribe Ritalin or some other drug to, to fix Mario's problems? Yes. Huh. That's a, In Switzerland, that's a, is, it, is it the, the same as America where, where that's common? Yes, it's common. It's more common than in the past because of permissive education. And the problem is uh, the problem is also modern psychiatry that Mike doesn't make distinction of diagnosis. It takes ADHD as a diagnosis and they don't have much other than uh, medication. And we are beginning in Switzerland to do like in America to treat children with medication. The symptoms. Little Mario would have received Ritalin in any case. Hmm. No doubts about that. 
Yeah. This is a sad story, sad story for psychiatry. I would add that it's not that medicines are good or bad, but uh, if you ignore the underlying emotional aspect of the functional um, picture of what's happening, that's the error. It's not so much that medicines are good or bad, but... Oh, exactly, but exactly. I think that there are children with severe character neurosis and a DHD, after many sessions, uh, you could begin with Ritalin. You can do nothing else because there are children that are really very severe. Yeah, I, so I agree. Little Mario, I've seen that too. little Mario was severe, but the diagnosis, fortunately for him, was not that deep. So yeah. it was worthy trying. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Foley, before we finish up today, what would you like to leave the audience with? This has been a wonderful discussion of Mario and, and the broader aspects of medical organ therapy. H how would you like to end things? I would like to end in uh, confirming that there is not a bad permissiveness and a good authoritarianism, a good uh, uh, permissiveness or uh, uh, a bad authoritarianism. It is always a, a problem of contact. And for me, the distinction that Reich made between primary and secondary emotion is really very, very important, not only in child rearing, but it is important also in social, in our social life for adults. So this distinction, primary and secondary emotion. Thank you, Dr. Folia. You're welcome. You're welcome. And to the audience, thank you for joining us today and thank you for the great questions. I hope you'll join us for our next webinar. It will be on Saturday, November 13th, also at 11 a.m., presented by Dr. Susan Marcel, connecting with a troubled teen through trust and music. And in the meantime, I hope you listen to our podcast, the A Different Kind of Psychiatry podcast. Thanks very much. <laughs>